Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The West is aghast at the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as if this is the first war they ever experienced, maybe because it's been so long since apparently civilized Europe was the victim of war, though not as long as we might think. After all, Belgrade was bombed by NATO in 1999, and the Balkan Wars of the former Yugoslavia ended in 1995. Everywhere in Europe, one can see the blue and yellow colors of Ukraine, boxes to collect aid for Ukraine, and an unprecedented solidarity. These are often sincere and laudable reactions. But one can't help but notice the double standards. Noam Chomsky famously spoke of worthy and unworthy victims. Today, Ukrainians are worthy victims, while all things Russian have been demonized and isolated in a manner unprecedented perhaps since Germany was punished for its role in the First World War. But we're supposed to forget and pretend. Let's forget that this punishment helped cause the Second World War. Let's pretend the rampant racism this has stoked against Russians, from the absurd to the dangerous, is totally okay. Let's erase the role NATO played in provoking this war. Let's erase all of the West's imperialist aggression, even as it continues today. Let's pretend Western values are superior, that they're all about freedom, despite censoring Russian media and branding anyone who questions the convenient mainstream narrative a Putin apologist. In fact, let's forget about history and context and nuance and reduce the world to good and evil and to children's stories. One man who won't let us do that is Joseph Massad, professor of modern Arab politics and intellectual history at Columbia University who tirelessly fights to remind the West of its hypocrisy and its history. Joseph, welcome. It's good to be here. Thank you, Rania. Well, it's good to have you back, actually. Uh, it's been a while, and I'm very excited to have you to come discuss what's happening in the world right now. And I guess a good place to start would be, you know, like I mentioned, you are a professor of modern Arab politics and intellectual history. But you've written two recent articles for Middle East Eye, which I encourage everybody to check out. Uh, excellent pieces uh, focused on the war in Ukraine. So very briefly, why did you shift your attention to this conflict? Um, first of all, I should say that I usually remind my readers, not the entire West, although I would like to have access to the entire West, to be able to remind them of this history. Um, in fact, I did not actually shift my focus at all. I mean, Russia and Ukraine uh, both have, you know, have relations and histories that are very much part of the history of the region which the West came to call the Middle East. Um, southern Ukraine, of course, uh, and the Crimea were former Ottoman regions that were conquered by the Tsars in the late 18th century and early 18th century. And Ukraine's separate colonial city of Odessa on the Black Sea, formerly, of course, the Ottoman city of Haji Bey, was the place where Greek anti-Muslim nationalism was born at the beginning of the 19th century and where colonial Jewish Zionism was born at the end of the 19th century. In fact, the first Jewish colonists who came to colonize Palestine in the 1880s were Ukrainian Jews from the separate colony of Odessa. Of course, also the Crimea is another place that the Tsars uh, chose for Russian Jewish colonization in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century and would continue to be a destination for uh, Russian uh, Jews that the Tsars had dispatched uh, as colonists and continued to do so even under the Soviets in the 1920s, who had partnered up with German um, Jewish American bankers uh, who uh, financed, it was a partnership, where they financed um, Russian Jewish colonization of the Crimea in the 1920s and 30s. There were even plans to declare the Crimea an autonomous Jewish republic in the Soviet Union, but as a result of the indigenous Tartar, Crimean Tatar uh, opposition, uh, the project was shifted to Birobidzhan by Stalin in uh, the middle of the 1930s. Um, at present, of course, both countries, Ukraine and Russia, have policies that are entangled with the Middle East. Um, uh, perhaps I should remind uh, uh, our audience that Ukraine uh, dispatched the third largest military contingent uh, to invade and occupy Iraq in 2003. And uh, its occupation troops, upwards of 5,000, I think, remained in, the, uh, in Iraq until 2008. 
also, of course, Ukraine officially has been a big supporter of Israel and its invasion and occupation of Gaza and other Palestinian and Syrian lands. As far as Russia is concerned, of course, Putin has also had excellent relations with Israel, but at the same time, he did intervene in Syria against the regime's uh, jihadist uh, and, and American and Gulf-supported enemies. However, his intervention in Syria continued to allow the Israelis to bomb Syria, but not the jihadists. Mm. Um, then, of course, there's also the issue of Ukrainian Jews today, which Israel is calling upon um, to immigrate, quote-unquote, immigrate to Israel so that it can transform them into colonists of the land of the Palestinians. So as you can see, there's a, you know, a long history and present entanglement uh, in our region uh, by both Russia and the Ukraine, let alone, of course, uh, the U.S. and Europe. Well said. And, you know, you have lived in the U.S. for decades and you wrote about this. You've experienced this kind of like American war fervor in the past when it came to other places such as the former Yugoslavia, Panama, Granada. And then there's the post 9-11 global killing spree, uh, the war on Iraq. So how do you see this current like crusade against Russia in this context of all of these other places I just mentioned? I mean, uh, listen, I, I arrived in the US uh, you know, in 1982 to go to college. This was sort of amidst the increased anti-Soviet hysteria, again, from the silly to the very dangerous, from uh, uh, commercials on television that showed Soviet society as drab and dystopic, uh, depicting uh, Soviet women as mannish and unfeminine. Uh, so th these kinds of sort of juvenile depictions for which American political culture is famous. Uh, but also, uh, in addition, of course, there was the idea of uh, the, the right wing at the time insisting that the U.S. should stop shipment of American wheat that it sold to the Soviet Union at the time. Um, I remember at rallies or at uh, events where American officials spoke, right wing Republicans would yell at them saying, starve Russia or starve the Soviet Union. I mean, I was 18 or 19 and it was shocking to witness uh, uh, such displays of, of uh, uh, you know, I almost like a, a genocidal wishes to starve a people. Um, but of course, uh, uh, the major hysteria that I lived through here began, of course, in uh, uh, the latter part also of the 1980s uh, with Reagan's uh, attack on Libya. Um, and at the time, the concern about alleged Arab uh, terrorists uh, in the US plans for internment camps for Arabs uh, by, you know, uh, after 9-11, uh, that was transformed into Muslims more generally. Uh, so we begin to see a much larger hysteria. So, um, uh, of course, in addition, you know, on a smaller scale, I remember witnessing in the 1980s when I came to the U.S., the anti-Japanese hysteria. This is at a time when Japanese investment in the U.S. in terms of businesses was uh, a lot less than German or British foreign investment. Yet, of course, because the Germans and the British were considered white, the, the threat was perceived to be Japanese investment. Uh, and, you know, you know, people were killed for looking Japanese or for being mistaken for being Japanese. Uh, members, Republican members of Congress would bring sledgehammers and destroy Toshiba electronic products in front of the Capitol. This is during the Reagan years. Um, so, um, you know, there was some uh, uh, interesting sort of horror that I did witness uh, here. When, when I first arrived in the U.S., uh, uh, you know, a, a week or so after my arrival, I remember walking on campus just to uh, explore uh, campus. This is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And suddenly a car full of white fraternity boys began to harass me, calling me Iranian and Persian. And I, I couldn't, really, I didn't really understand. I was not terribly politicized at the time. And I wasn't sure what this was about. It took me sort of a, a second to understand what was going on. Um, so um, yes, it was a very strange uh, uh, culture shock, I must say, to come into this kind of a uh, uh, mob mentality uh, during these kinds of mobilization of anti some country hysteria or anti some population hysteria usually generated by the American political class and the corporate media. So um, uh, I had not witnessed anything like it growing up in Jordan, of course. 
That's incredible, actually. It's kind of like actually a compliment maybe to be considered Persian, not by my white fraternity boys, but <laughs> that's actually pretty scary. That's yeah, but I mean, I, mean I, I got to feel what many Iranians must have felt who had been in this country after 79 and 80. I came only in 82. And this was just sort of some harassment and taunting sort of in the car going back and forth. And I didn't know what they were doing or what that was about. Uh, so uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I can imagine having gone through this uh, very, you know, I mean, uh, uh, a moderate experience of harassment on the street, which at the end, of course, terrified because I wasn't sure if they were going to disembark and uh, uh, beat me up or something. Right. Uh, but I can, you know, but I can imagine what must have happened to uh, uh, many Iranians or those mistaken for them on American streets during that period. So I want to I do want to get back to some of the Russophobia that we're seeing right now, because some of it's so ridiculous, but it's also really frightening. But I, I you know, on, on Breakthrough News and a lot of the programming we've had on Breakthrough News, we've we've made a point to every time we talk about what's happening in Ukraine to discuss the context of how we got here, because it's so often obviously missing from the entire mainstream narrative on this. And since Russia invaded Ukraine, what we've seen is this attempt to really pathologize Vladimir Putin as some like crazy madman, which isn't new. I mean, we see with every U.S. adversary, the leader of whatever country they're at war with or they want to go to war with is um, portrayed as a madman who's comparable to Hitler. There's like the Hitler comparison uh, starts to come into play. And of course, the point of doing this is to strip away that understanding of the context of how we got here, which oftentimes involves policies of the U.S. and its allies. So you actually you wrote a piece about this. The title is Russia, Ukraine War, How the West Backed Putin into a Corner. So I'm wondering if you can briefly offer us your analysis of why and how this happened. I should begin, of course, by saying that um, it is also this service to the struggle against Nazism and Hitler mm -hmm to claim that Hitler was also a madman. Hitler was a, you know, a calculating, uh, rational, uh, genocidal, uh, 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 criminal sort of uh, ruler, and not mad in that sense, any more than uh, American presidents who have uh, uh, also planned genocidal bombings around the world since World War II have been mad. So the idea of this, this investment in mental sanity that is claimed to be uh, uh, the property of American policymakers or West European policymakers, but is denied to their enemies, is quite a, 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 an interesting thing that they constantly uh, uh, insist on bringing up when, uh, you know, when, when dealing with uh, adversaries, rather than acknowledge that their adversaries are as smart as they, that their adversaries have issues which the West may not see as legitimate, but uh, you know, it, it would be logical for their adversaries to see as. Uh, 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 rational. They uh, in, I mean, so, so there's a lack of honesty constantly in the insistence that anyone who opposes uh, uh, U.S. or West European policy must be irrational and mad. At any rate, no. Of course, uh, what I um, that there's a very important historical context, especially since the Russian Revolution in 1917. Immediately after the uh, Russian Revolution uh, uh, was triumphant, uh, aside from the West funding, especially Britain, um, uh, uh, and, and at the time, uh, Winston Churchill, funding white armies to go on a rampage committing pogroms uh, in, in the Pale of Settlement with the majority of uh, Soviet Jews lived at that time, as well as uh, funding uh, battles against the Red Army, both in uh, the southern, uh, so southern Soviet Russia, in eastern Soviet Russia, Russia and in Western Soviet Russia. Uh, subsequently, the West realized that they could not rely only on these militias uh, that were remnants of the Tsarist army and 14 Western armies, you know, including Japan uh, from the East, uh, invaded uh, Soviet Russia to destroy the country. Um, there's always, I always remember the joke when Gorbachev had a summit with uh, President Reagan um, uh, in the mid 1980s and Reagan um, not terribly educated or knowledgeable about American history, let alone Soviet <laughs> history, turns to Gorbachev and tells him, but you know, I'm very happy that our countries had never gone to war. Only for Gorbachev to look at him and say, what? You invaded us after the revolution. But uh, so uh, be that as it may, 
of course, uh, uh, even after the, 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 the uh, or with, with during uh, these invasions uh, and the ongoing civil war between the Tsarist armies, also Poland, which had just become independent with the support of Soviet Russia, its new nationalist uh, uh, leaders, General Pilsudski, insisted on expanding the territory of the newly independent Poland, which had not been independent for a century and a half or more decided to invade Soviet Russia to acquire more territories. And indeed, um, at the end, while at, at the beginning, they were uh, uh, held back uh, with French help and the British, they ultimately prevailed and the Soviets uh, were uh, sort of uh, forced to sign uh, uh, a treaty uh, conceding a lot of their territory, including Western Ukraine and Belarusia, uh, uh, to uh, Poland. Um, of course, uh, the big issue uh, uh, in terms of memory and almost living memory for uh, Russian citizens today is the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Um, but remember, uh, uh, usually the West forgets and often you hear a lot of cold warriors constantly repeating uh, the Western mantra that it was Stalin who had signed the non-aggression pact with Hitler um, in August 1939. What they forget, in fact, is that between 1933 and 1939, Western Europe especially the British, were very much cultivating relations with Nazi Germany in the hope of actually having uh, an alliance against the Soviet Union. At the time, the Nazis had already signed uh, the so-called anti-communist international treaty with Japan and Italy and Hungary, um, among others, in order to encircle the Soviet Union from the East and the West. But the British, of course, had already uh, signed the 1935 Anglo-German Naval Agreement uh, with, uh, uh, of course, the Nazis, which was followed in 1936 um, by the British acquiescence in Hitler's militarization of the Rhineland, which was in contravention with the Versailles Treaty. So by the time they signed, the British signed the Munich Agreement um, uh, in uh, September 1938, uh, along with uh, France uh, and Italy, they did, they did that behind uh, uh, the Soviet Union, who in fact had wanted uh, or was in fact had a non-aggression treaty and mutual defense treaty with Czechoslovakia. The Munich Agreement, of course, facilitated uh, the Nazi invasion and occupation of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the French refused uh, to help uh, militarily and the Soviets were kept out of the picture in this very important Western alliance against the Soviet Union. Um, so as a result of this, you know, an ongoing relations by July 1939, in fact, uh, uh, British Prime Minister Chamberlain's permanent undersecretary of the Treasury at the time, Sir Horace Wilson, proposed to Hitler an Anglo-German defensive alliance for 25 years and that Germany's former colonies in Africa would be returned to her by you know, stages. I, I quote uh, uh, from the proposal, amongst other sort of economic goodies that the British were promising Germany, if Germany at the time were to pledge to undertake you know, no action in Europe and especially in Poland. At the time, the Germans were open. Hitler found the offer uh, interesting and proceeded to talk to them uh, uh, in August 1939. This is the month when Stalin decided to, to sign the non-aggression pact when he realized that unless he did that to delay the possible and very likely Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, um, the German alliance with Britain and other European countries might result in a much earlier invasion. So, um, of course, the invasion did come through, um, and as a result of the uh, Nazi invasion of, of Poland, uh, uh, Stalin decided to uh, invade Eastern Poland and, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, annex uh, you know, all the former Soviet territories that were invaded and occupied by the Poles back in 19, between 1920 and 1921. Uh, so, uh, so this was sort of the context uh, after which, of course, uh, unannounced the Germans would uh, invade the Soviet Union um, and go on a sort of rampage, destroying the country, killing upwards of 26 million people 
um, until the Soviets uh, were able to rebuff that invasion and win the war for the world. After all, 90% of Nazi casualties uh, were actually on the Soviet front. Uh, the Americans did not enter the war till you know, uh, late 1941, in fact, early 1942 after the Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, the Americans, of course, did lose about 450,000 soldiers, but compared to 26 million people in this country, um, uh, the trauma of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union remains a living trauma for those who had uh, uh, now become uh, Russians. Uh, so in that sense, um, there is that history of encirclement. In the last, of course, uh, uh, 30 years, the West and NATO had continued to expand eastwards to encircle uh, Russia. Um, they included in the European Union most of uh, the formerly socialist uh, Eastern European countries, and uh, as well as in NATO, including former Soviet Republic, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and had been hoping to bring in uh, Ukraine to finally uh, close the circle around uh, Russia uh, from the European side uh, uh, with uh, NATO armaments and a NATO alliance. Um, so this is the background that had provoked uh, uh, Putin's uh, Russian response, uh, military response, uh, regrettable as that may be. Right. And it is interesting that it's this kind of obviously not exact repeat, but what do they say that history doesn't repeat, but it echoes or something? I don't know. I'm like ruining the quote. Uh, but either twice, the first time as tragedy, the second time. Well, there you twice. go. There's Marx. Right. And so well, in this well, case, Interestingly, Marx always said that uh, this quote comes from Hegel, although Marx did not tell us where it came from, and no one since Marx said this has been able to find a quote from Hegel that said this. So actually, <laughs> Marx invented the quote. <laughs> so yeah, we'll give it to Marx. But it's, I mean, it's it's a really obviously interesting, important history to understand why Russia, why Russian leaders might be making the decisions that they're making today. Um, but you know, one thing that's been really fascinating, I think, for all of us especially those of us um, who come from other parts of the world that aren't Europe, uh, have found have found really both infuriating but also somewhat amusing is we've heard many reporters and pundits make the case that the war in Ukraine is like more shocking, right? It's like more upsetting than the wars that the West has launched against countries in the global South, like Iraq and Afghanistan, because in this case, it's happening in civilized Europe. And of course, I'm using the words of various reporters we've seen say these things over the last few weeks. How do you respond to that notion, this notion that Europe is more civilized and also the people there are more prosperous and war is not natural? I mean, especially given the, the history that you just laid out, this, the part that war is not natural across Europe, especially not in the way it is in places like Iraq or Afghanistan. What's your response to that idea? I mean, first of all, it seems to me that this is really the you know latest embodiment of the white supremacist slogan that only white lives matter. Uh, but you know, and this, is, this is something that you have in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, as you know, World War II cost about 54 million European lives, a scale of killing unknown around the world in modern or even ancient times. So yeah, perhaps you know, the most violent people on the planet have always been and remain European in that sense. Um, and the fact that they think that, that Europeans who have enslaved millions of people around the world, committed genocide around the world, who have come up with the most horrendous torture methods uh, to torture the colonized and those they deemed non-white and non-European around the world think of themselves as more civilized than their victims is itself, of course, uh, very interesting and ironic. Uh, but remember, you know, this is not very different from the reaction that Europeans have had um, and white Americans have had since World War II, um, where uh, they mourned uh, the white victims of Nazism, um, you know, uh, and continue to refuse the more, to mourn the brown and black victims of U.S. and European genocides across the colonial world. I mean, even European Jews, who of course, 
It took a while to rehabilitate them as white Europeans in the 1950s. Only after the rehabilitation, you begin to see more uh, uh, sympathy with European Jews as victims of Nazism. Although we haven't seen the same kind of sympathy, for example, toward uh, the Roma people, half a million of whom also were killed by uh, Hitler's genocidal machine. On the contrary, today, those Holocaust survivors continue to be harassed by the French police or deported, spat upon, etc. But uh, they don't belong to uh, a category that has been whiteified and Europeanized uh, for European audiences. Uh, so in that sense, uh, perhaps I can uh, you know, quote uh, or cite here uh, the important uh, surrealist and Martinican thinker and poet M. Césaire, who had uh, uh, you know, written or spoken the speech on colonialism that was published back in 1950, in which he described Nazism as colonialism internalized, meaning mm. colonialism that has been externalized toward Africa and Asia and the Americas and Oceania has finally has come home to roost. That the problem, the reason why Europeans were traumatized by what Hitler had done was not because of the nature of the crimes, but the nature of the victims of the crimes. That suddenly what they had done to the rest of the world and continued to do, uh, Europeans themselves had become victims of it. Uh, Césaire insisted that this was the reason that uh, uh, Europeans were traumatized by World War II and not because they object to the nature of these crimes whose uh, colonial governments continued, of course, to commit after World War II at will. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, all the way to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, it is uh, a tradition of racism, a tra tradition of uh, barbaric uh, disrespect for human life when it's not white or Christian, um, uh, that continues to live in the so-called uh, uh, political culture and media culture of civilized Europe. It really is incredible, too, because, you know, when we think of fascism, obviously, it's this like violent enforcement of capitalism. But it is that internalized colonialism, because all of those policies that end up being inflicted and, and like terrorizing the local population, whether it's in like Italy or France or in Germany um, or some parts of the U.S., those policies, like you mentioned, are like were, were taken from somewhere and it was taken from what Germany did in Africa, what Germany did to Namibia. I mean, the Nazis uh, uh, learned very, very well from uh, you know, German colonial policy and genocides in uh, East Africa and in Southwest Africa in Namibia and in Tanganyika, where a genocidal uh, uh, German machine had killed uh, hundreds of thousands thousands of people in Tanganyika and tens of thousands in Southwest Africa or Namibia. Uh, but also they had learned from uh, uh, white Americans. So, and in fact, of course, the Nazis had learned a great deal of, uh, uh, you know, of the strategies for their projects from the US. They were very influenced by Manifest Destiny. And what they wanted to do was, in fact, the settler colonization of Eastern Europe, of Poland and Russia. And indeed, uh, Hitler would refer to uh, the Slavs as uh, uh, red Indians um, and would learn sort of like, you know, the whole idea of living space and Lebensraum from the Americans. Um, in fact, he had learned even uh, 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 many of the legal strategies to institutionalize uh, German racism in Germany with the Nuremberg Laws after having dispatched several uh, uh, German lawyers and uh, legal scholars to the U.S., who amazingly enough came back slightly horrified at the extremeness of the racism of the Americans with the one blood rule about what makes a black person black. Um, and as a result, of course, they uh, tried to slightly modify that to uh, um, uh, someone would be a Jewish uh, if, if he or she had one uh, grandparent that was Jewish, meaning one eighth rather than the one at uh, one uh, drop of black blood. So, uh, as you know, so in any case, even the Germans seemed to be horrified at the time by American race laws and uh, under Jim Crow. Um, nonetheless, the, po the point is, of course, that uh, uh, much of this, uh, the identification uh, between the Germans and the Americans or the British was always over the kind of victimization of non-white people. 
Jews. Of course, the Germans had no ideas about even Europeans not being properly Aryan, including Slavs, including Jews, including Roma people. Um, and, and this is precisely what created the kind of uh, trauma after World War II once a lot of these populations came to be considered white. So as a result, of course, uh, uh, the celebration of whiteness, but also the horror at the, victim, the victimization of white people uh, uh, lives on as you know white lives are more valuable than the lives of non-white folks. Of course. And now what's so amazing, too, is that as we watch, you know, we've watched over decades the weaponization of Nazism, right? The West uses it when it's convenient um, to, you know, for its own geopolitical interest to say there's Nazis there, there's Nazis there. But then suddenly Nazis become OK when their existence is actually beneficial for Western interests. And of course, here I'm talking about the neo-Nazi element in Ukraine. Now, of course, you know, I do think Russia is probably over, you know, over exaggerate or exaggerating the the, uh, you know, Nazi elements in Ukraine. I don't agree that they necessarily run the entire government. But that said, you know, what do you make of the neo-Nazi threat in Ukraine? Is it, do you think it's overblown and or is it more being whitewashed and dismissed? Um, I think there's, it, it is being whitewashed, uh, but at the same time, I don't think it is the only force in Ukraine, but it is a, it is a, a substantial force uh, since 2014, especially. Um, I mean, just look at what happened since then. Hundreds of statues were erected across Ukraine um, and street names were changed and, and, and substituted for Ukrainian Nazi collaborators and nationalists like you know, Stepan Bandera and the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. People like Roman uh, Shukhevich and others also were rehabilitated as major Ukrainian nationalists despite their anti-Semitism, but more importantly, despite their collaboration with the Nazis during the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. You have to remember here that um, uh, the the kind of the rehabilitation of European anti-Semites and Nazi collaborators, especially in Eastern Europe, in the last 20 or 30 years by uh, uh, Ukrainian right-wing Nazis or by Polish right-wingers or Hungarian uh, right-wingers who in Hungary, they, you know, they try to rehabilitate or continue to rehabilitate General Horty amongst, uh, amongst others. All of that is an important element because, of course, the only people who were not anti-Semitic in the leadership in Poland or in the political leadership or political forces of Poland, Hungary, or Ukraine were the communists. All the nationalists were, in fact, anti-Semitic Nazi collaborators um, at that time. And of course, uh, uh, Germans today feel a bit shortchanged because, of course, given the fact that you know uh, uh, Hitler was German, they only have Willy Brandt to kind of uh, fall back on. Um, they can't really celebrate other German nationalists, maybe Bismarck uh, as the unifier of the nation, but even that seems sometimes problematic. So as a result, what you see for Ukrainian nationalists who want to be anti-Soviet and anti-Russian today, um, you know th th what what they appeal to is precisely a history of anti-communism, which was always a fascist history of collaboration with Nazis and anti-Semites. Uh, nonetheless, of course, uh, these forces uh, today uh, continue to be strong, I think, especially since 2014. But let me remind you that just last month, in fact, Ukraine had issued a new law to criminalize anti-Semitic acts for the first time, given the rise in the last few years of uh, 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 sort of anti-Semitic vandalism, swastika drawing on synagogues in Ukraine, and on Jewish memorials, even marches in Kiev or other Ukrainian cities which celebrated the Waffen SS, the German Nazi Party's militia. Um, so, uh, and this is in addition, of course, to the existence of people like, uh, or, or, or the, the Azov Battalion, which is now part of the Ukrainian National Guard, right-wing parties that like this Svoboda Party or the right sector. Uh, in that sense, you know, uh, the fact that neo-Nazis today are part of Ukraine's current volunteer battalions, the fact mm. that they were part of the for, you know, the fighters against uh, Ukrainian citizens of Russian background uh, in the Donbass region, uh, which they, uh, uh, you know, helped kill uh, since 2014. Um, all of that uh, speaks to the danger uh, to uh, 
people identified as non-Ukrainian, um, uh, you know, but especially non-white people, given the declarations of Ukrainian uh, leaders who speak about uh, uh, white Christian people. So uh, the fact that, of course, uh, uh, today uh, the president of Ukraine uh, is of Jewish background, even though he's on many occasions told us that he has 20 more important things to identify himself with before being Jewish, although don't, suddenly now he uses his Jewishness to defend um, uh, the country against the accusations of the existence of so many neo-Nazi elements. Uh, he clearly has uh, accommodated these mm -hmm. uh, uh, neo-Nazi groups. He sat down with them. Indeed, uh, uh, his key benefactor, the, uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian Jewish uh, businessman, or uh, if we want also to Israeli. Use so, oligarch, or, you know, the, the oligarch Igor Kolomoisky uh, himself uh, is a key benefactor to the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion, and of course a, a, a funder of the campaign uh, uh, of the president himself. So, um, in many ways, you know, the, the, the Ukrainian Jewish president has ceded ground to the neo-Nazis uh, in the country, had entrusted them with like, a frontline role in his country's war against pro-Russian. And Russian forces. So uh, yes, they're there. They're not the only forces that are there, um, uh, but they're an important and significant part of uh, 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 the political forces um, uh, that want to align itself with NATO and with the West. So you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but I, I actually want to quote you from your last piece. You wrote, as the ongoing Russophobic campaigns have unified Western conservatives and liberals in the US and Europe, I feel confident in saying that most likely, if you scratch many a white liberal, you will find a white supremacist cold warrior. So can you explain what you meant by that? Listen, I mean, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've always felt that uh, uh, the hypocrisy of uh, American liberals, especially white American liberals, is is you know is just so so limitless in that sense. Um, first of all, of course, most American uh, uh, liberals have always been called warriors um, and uh, have always supported also white supremacist policies as long as they are in many ways couched in a liberal language that does not use explicit. Uh, uh, racial classifications. Uh, but nonetheless, they supported laws that uh, 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 within the US, for example, that victimized non-white peoples, as long as the way they were, the, the designation of people to be victimized was not explicitly made as racial. And they've supported imperialist wars against non-white peoples throughout their careers. Even in my small world of academia, um, I'm always uh, um, taken aback by academics uh, and colleagues who claim to be leftist, even Marxist, um, uh, even though, you know, have, they've always been cold warriors. And in many ways, though I consider most of these academics who claim to be on the left uh, outright liberals, I'm always baffled by the fact that they think liberals are other people and not themselves. But, not, but nonetheless, this is a, a very interesting sort of phenomenon um, amongst uh, uh, Western liberals, especially, of course, uh, white liberals. Um, I, I, I just think sort of in, in general, uh, this has been the mark of uh, 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 sort of politics in the West. Even people like Noam Chomsky, if you recall, he's never tired of calling the Soviet Union uh, uh, an empire, even during the Reagan years. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, his counter, and, and of course, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed uh, in 1991. He also felt that it was like one empire down, one empire to go. There was no distinction that was made. Um, so, um, I mean, I think Cold War uh, depictions and, polit and, and politics in, in, in terms of political culture amongst liberals in the West has always been a, a standard uh, uh, value. Uh, real and uh, imagined crimes uh, of the Soviet system, real and imagined policies are mixed up in the lore of the Cold War that often, uh, uh, you know, sober minded uh, academics are uh, confuse them and uh, cite them as equally verifiable. Um, not to mention, of course, uh, uh, journalists who don't even need to verify uh, these claims. Um, 
at any rate, so um, uh, this has always been uh, uh, a problem that I have found uh, in attending to these kinds of arguments. Um, I, I remember this also having taken place during uh, the war on Yugoslavia. I remember this during the bombing of Bosnia. Um, I remember even have at the time having uh, uh, arguments. Uh, you know, I was in, in, in graduate school uh, with uh, colleagues and friends who, white colleagues and friends, who uh, seemed to express a kind of solidarity uh, with Muslim women, often usually absent uh, from their politics, in the case of Bosnia. And I was shocked at the racism because they were absolutely horrified about uh, 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 the reports of uh, rape or sexual abuse of Bosnia and Muslim women. Um, and of course, I, I explained to them that of course all wars are horrible and all wars have always used these amazingly horrifying sexist methods to target women sexually in addition to uh, violently. And I wasn't sure why the, somehow uh, when Muslim women are victims of this, it is more horrible than other women. Of course, it was always the Orientalism and the idea that somehow sexuality is something to be protected more for Muslims than for other populations. So even that kind of sympathy was always tinged with the kind of Orientalism uh, um, uh, toward Muslims. So, um, so I think, you know, I've, I've never seen uh, American liberals, let alone leftists, uh, be uh, in any way free from these Orientalist, Cold War, uh, imperialist uh, biases, which um, often inform their judgments, even if they may differ uh, in degree from their right-wing conservative uh, counterparts. Yeah, and I think some of those judgments too also include some of the group think and conformity that's led to a support for censorship. What I think is just blatant censorship right now. We see the entire Russian media apparatus being completely taken off of these social media platforms like YouTube, in addition to people demanding that anybody that they perceive as promoting Russian narratives should be taken offline as well as and of course it's coming from the same people who are claiming to support western values like freedom of speech and this brings me to something else i wanted to quote actually from you from something that you wrote because i thought it was really an interesting perspective is speaking of the sort of group think and conformity you said you write having grown up in jordan under an autocratic regime i learned like many jordanians to believe very little that the government or media said. I remain partial to the idea that autocratic regimes foster democratic skepticism in their populations, while Western liberal democratic regimes foster utter conformity and subservience to the Ministry of Truth, as George Orwell dubbed it. And I'm just, I'm just curious if you can elaborate a little bit on that, because I think it's a really um, interesting way of looking at what we're witnessing happen in these so-called democracies in the West right now. I mean, this is, this is the thing I've always observed, you see. I mean, any kind of um, uh, contrary opinion or questioning of the received truth, even in my classes when I was uh, uh, attending uh, university at an undergraduate level or at the graduate level, uh, people would refer to what I would say as controversial. This is a very interesting term. Uh, it doesn't exist in many other languages, actually, except as direct translation from English, precisely as a way of putting people who question the received wisdom or the idée reçue outside legitimacy. Of course, controversial simply means that you're saying something against what is being spoken, but it immediately puts you uh, sort of uh, off the charts of what is acceptable within the political spectrum of uh, mainstream society. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, many people don't like to be controversial because they understand the cost to be paid for that. But even uh, then, within that rubric, I mean, I, I, I do remember being uh, quite uh, um, uh, impressed with a couple of books that uh, Chomsky uh, had uh, published uh, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. One was called Manufacturing Consent, another was called Necessary Illusions, precisely about how the American press and the Western press uh, produce a quiescent public uh, that uh, you know, accepts the received wisdom. I, I mean, I always tell um, my students who are often shocked when they hear this um, about how you know, the US, you know, I, I ask them if they think the US has been a democracy, and they say yes, because this is what I always learned in uh, graduate school, that the US has been a democracy since 1776. So I ask them if they believe this, and they often say this, say yes, 
uh, when I tell them, do you not know that there was slavery for the first hundred years? There was apartheid for the second hundred years. Um, oh, yes, we do. We did know. Did you know that women could not vote until, you know, after World War I for like 150 years? Oh, we knew that. Did you know that Native Americans could not vote till pretty much 1948? Uh, yes, yes, we knew this. So when you say that actually the U.S. has been a democracy since 1776, you're saying you are actually white class and race supremacists because the only people who could vote were property owning white men during this period. They're shocked and they're taken aback. Um, but, you know, you have a, 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 the government, the educational system, and the media propagates these ideas um, that can stand the test, even though uh, my students, like many Americans, know these, uh, you know, important facts about U.S. history, but it doesn't challenge the understanding that the U.S. has been a democracy, allegedly, since the 1776. Uh, so in that sense, I've always felt that there's a kind of a, uh, 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 a dictatorial and subservient type of, of, of uh, populace uh, uh, in the U.S. After all, of course, much of U.S. culture and West European culture, like the rest of the world and like the rest of the capitalist system, is built on a kind of a, a dictatorial a military system that one lives uh, within every day of one's life. After all, there is no democracy at one's job in the corporations and banks in companies, you know, uh, you, you you do what you're told to do by your boss. There's no, like, committee where you discuss what your role is going to be. So it's actually a military system at work. It's a military system even at school. I assign my students, you know, the readings that I choose. I decide how I will grade. Um, I also, of course, have to also follow uh, the dicta of my university. There is no democracy in daily life. At home, parents run the show. So the only aspect of democratic life, of course, has to do with uh, uh, kind of procedural voting, which most mm -hmm. Americans, of course, don't do, uh, and, and even those who do, or you know, forty percent of them who vote for year, for you know, uh, uh, for uh, uh, once every four years, um, this is the only experience of democratic uh, decision making that they make, assuming that the elections are even democratic when they're, of course, candidates are chosen by wealthy corporations. Nonetheless, so the point is that despite the absence of democracy in daily life. People believe that they live in this uh, democratic system um, in many ways. But um, I've always differed with Chomsky uh, on uh, uh, you know, what the undertone or the, you know, the subtext of his books was, meaning that if the American population uh, or even the Europeans would know the truth of what is done in their name by their governments, they would oppose the government. I don't think that's actually true. I think the uh, US government would gladly tell most, uh, you know, uh, especially middle class white Americans who live in the suburbs, would gladly tell them the truth that, in fact, the US government had to kill about 25 million people in wars around the world since World War II, precisely to guarantee for them, uh, you know, a conformist house that looks like every other house on the block, uh, two cars, and, you know, they can buy Budweiser beer or something. And that in order for them to, in order for it to guarantee, uh, uh, these uh, uh, luxuries for them, it has to carry out these wars around the world. Um, most Americans would say, uh, yes, please, you know, we would like to keep these lovely possessions. And we agree you shouldn't show us what you do around the world. We'd rather have a lovely story on tell about, you know, saving the dog or a cat in a tree um, and pretend this is not happening. So I don't actually believe that if most Americans had the choice, they would choose to actually know what is being done in their name. Um, I think they would choose actually not to know and continue to receive the benefits. And I think that would be with other, any other populations, except that, of course, it applies to Americans and Europeans, um, given the fact that this is where the center of capitalism and imperialism right. has been for the last 400 years. Well, that's, that is certainly one way to look at it. And yeah, that, that if true, that really, that's a hard, yeah, it's if true, that sucks, but if there is a truth to it, right? Is obviously these populations that are benefiting are the least likely to want to change that system. I, I know that, that you're, I know that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, what I want to say, very much so. And of course, I mean, the American officials have no shame about suppressing, for example, 
for example, freedom of expression. Uh, today, uh, Henry Wooster, the American ambassador in Jordan, had a televised interview uh, uh, with a Jordanian TV station during which he uh, 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 sort of uh, remarked or demanded or at least uh, 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 asked that the Jordanian media cease and desist from quoting or using Russian media for anything within Jordan to cover what's happening in Russia. So he was essentially asking Jordan to suppress freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Uh, this is the American ambassador, of course, chosen by Trump but also appointed by Congress and serving at the behest of the Biden administration. Um, shameless, shameless uh, 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 in what they consider to be uh, uh, their right to choose uh, which views should be aired out and which views should not. I mean, they've already chosen, at least online. I'm in Lebanon and I can't, I can't watch RT on YouTube. I can still see it on TV, but... That, I mean, that's just incredible, the arrogance of the American ambassador telling a country on the other side of the world what they can, what they should or shouldn't broadcast. Um, I know, I, you know, I know your time is precious and I don't want to take too much more of it. There's just two things I briefly want to touch on that I think are important with respect to this conversation. And one of them is the, I think, irony of embracing, as people across the political spectrum in the West have, embracing canceling an entire country like Russia in every way imaginable, while simultaneously continuing to call any boycotting of even Israeli settlements anti-Semitic and the double standards about resistance to occupation that we're seeing with respect to Ukraine versus Palestine. And I'm just curious your, your thoughts on that very like in your face hypocrisy that we're witnessing. Or Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, or Cuba or Nicaragua, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, 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 so th this is precisely it. It's it's uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Reagan period when uh, Reagan's uh, uh, sort of uh, ostentatious uh, United Nations ambassador at the time, Jean Kirkpatrick, made an important classificatory di uh, distinction between uh, our dictators and their dictators, meaning. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, dictators that are allied with us are called authoritarian, while dictators allied with them are called totalitarian. So this is this is the 1980s, uh, but of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, this was important. The West, of course, considered uh, uh, the guerrilla, the Onita guerrilla movement in uh, Angola, which was allied and funded by apartheid South Africa freedom fighters, while they denigrated uh, the MPLA, which was a, uh, at the time a socialist, uh, uh, anti-racist, anti-colonial uh, guerrilla group as uh, terrorists. Uh, you find something similar that happened in Nicaragua uh, in the 1980s with the Contras being dubbed freedom fighters, as of course the Mujahideen of Afghanistan were uh, in the 1980s before, of course, uh, they uh, transform into the Taliban. So again, it is all contextual. It has to do with, it doesn't, it never has to do with principles. This is, I don't have to tell you this or tell your audience this. Um, it has to do with, uh, you know, American and European interests. The, the current hysteria is really not about, uh, a, a, you know, Russian invasion as such or about the Ukraine. It is about, in fact, um, uh, defiance uh, of American and West European uh, imperial authority around the world, which has been chipped away at in a way that is uh, absolutely threatening to the future of empire. Uh, as a result, you see uh, the US and Western Europe almost flailing their arms, throwing everything they have at this to quash the possibility that their dominion on this planet could in any way be threatened. Wow, that's a really good way to put it. And that's why you see the BBC giving like instructional manuals for how to make a Molotov cocktail. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to just briefly touch on is you mentioned our dictators versus their dictators. One of our dictators, and by our, I mean one of the American dictators, is of course the leadership in Saudi Arabia, which just executed 81 people in a single day, all by beheading, I think one of which was actually arrested when he was 13 years old. Um, this was all under, of course, the auspices of fighting terrorism. All of these people were accused of terrorism. So I'm just curious your thoughts on our very good dictatorial friends in Saudi Arabia executing 
81 people in a single day while the Americans run around the world claiming to be protecting democracy. I, I, you should also add that it was a sectarian massacre. Basically, the majority of those executed were Shiites, Saudi Shiites, uh, accused of allegedly uh, uh, spying or working for Iran or something to that effect. Uh, and given the, you know, the anti-Shiite sectarian campaign, whipped up by the Saudis and the Americans since 2003, after the American occupation of Iraq, uh, you know, this became, you know, this is acceptable type uh, of behavior. Yes, of course, you know, I'm sure, I mean, the the, the, the British government, I think today uh, condemned uh, uh, the executions because it opposes capital punishment. But my understanding is that Boris Johnson is flying to Saudi Arabia to talk to them about uh, Oil prices uh, in the next day or two, but not about the 81 that they executed. So, um, in that sense, uh, uh, yes, of course. I mean, the, 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 the sins of our friends and our sins are uh, uh, forgiven, but uh, not of others. Um, so, uh, uh, again, there's nothing new. It's just about um, uh, the real American and European values of self interest, the values of capitalism and profit, um, and of maintaining empire as uh, uh, you know, the most important structure for their dominion uh, uh, on this planet. So um, nothing new. Nothing new for the oil barons of Saudi Arabia. Joseph, I want to thank you for coming on and giving us your amazing, excellent, brilliant analysis as always. And I want to remind everybody who's listening and watching that you should check out Joseph's column. You, I think you do like a weekly column, right? It's weekly. No, it's like twice monthly, so it's a four twice monthly. monthly. I wish it was weekly. Your twice monthly column at Middle East Eye, which is always, I mean, a shining example of where we should all be understanding what's happening in the world on so many different issues. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me.